May God bless you all. Today we're going to continue our catechesis on the Song of Songs. And we're going to continue to see the contribution of origin concerning the preface and the title of the book. Well then, says Origen, as we have made it clear in the preceding remarks, one individual is without offspring and barren, as far as the interior self is concerned, and another is rich in offspring. And we note the following saying that accords with this. The barren has born seven, and she who has many children is weakened. 1 Samuel 2, 5. One might further add what is said in the blessings. There will be none among you that is childless and barren. See Exodus 23, verse 26. Well, but if this is how things stand, then just as one kind of desire is called fleshy, the desire that the poets call Cupid, in accordance with which the person who desires sows to the flesh, so too there is a certain spiritual desire in accordance with which that interior self, the one that desires, so to the spirit. Galatians 6, 8. And to speak more plainly, any who still bear the image of the earthly humanity in their outer self are driven by an earthly lust and earthly love, but any who bear the image of the heavenly humanity, 1 Corinthians 15, 49, in their interior self are driven by a heavenly lust and love. But the soul is driven by a heavenly desire and lust when it has detected the beauty and comeliness of the word of God and has been captivated by him and that, him, and that his hand has received a certain dart and wound of desire. For this word is the image and shining brightness of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, in whom all things are created, both things in heaven and things on earth, whether visible or invisible. Colossians 1.15 following. If then one has the mental capacity to hold together in one mind and to contemplate the loveliness and grace of all these things, that have been created in him, then struck by the elegant beauty and the magnificent splendor of the things themselves, and as the prophet says, pierced through by a chosen arrow, Isaiah 49 verse 2, one will receive from him the wound that is saving and will burn with the blessed fire of the desire of him. There is another point that we must be aware of, just as an illicit and unlawful desire may come to the outer self, as when, for example, he desires not his betrothed bride or wife, but a harlot or an adulteress, so too it can come about for the interior self, which is to say the soul, that she desires not her legitimate betrothed, which we have uh, identified as the word of God, but some adulterer or debauchee. So much does the prophet Ezekiel, using this very same figure, declare when he introduces Ohola and Oholiba to stand for Samaria and Jerusalem as corrupted by an adulterous desire, Ezekiel 23, verses 4 to 5. And indeed, this very passage of the prophetic writing demonstrates his point for those who want a fuller understanding of the matter. What is more, even the spiritual desire proper to the soul, as we have taught, flames out at some times toward certain spirits of evil and at others toward the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The word is the faithful bridegroom and is called the husband of the enlightened soul. And it is on his account that the bride herself, especially in the scriptural book now before us, is so named. 
It seems to me, however, that the Divine Scripture, wanting to take care that no more lapse should come about in its readers because of the word desire, and having in mind the welfare of weaker readers, assigned the name delight, or the name love, agape, to what among the wise of this present age had been called lust or desire. For example, as when it says of Isaac, and he took Rebecca, and she became his wife, and he loved her. We can see this in Genesis 24, 67. Here, therefore, and in many other passages, you will find that the divine scripture shunned the, the term desire, and instead set down the light and love. Nevertheless, now and then, though rarely, it calls desire by its proper name. It summons souls and spurs them on to desire, as when in Proverbs it says concerning wisdom, Desire her intensely, and she will preserve you, embrace her, and she will exalt you, respect her, that she may unfold you. Proverbs 4, verse 6 and 8. And in the book called The Wisdom of Solomon, it is written concerning wisdom herself, I have become a desirer of her beauty. Wisdom 8.2 I think, though, that the word desire is inserted only when there seems to be no occasion of more relapse, for what that is shameful or liable to passion can anyone discern in the desire of wisdom or in someone who professes to be a desirer of wisdom? On the one hand, if it had said that Isaac desired Rebecca passionately or that Jacob desired Rachel some shameful passion, could indeed be understood to have affected the holy man of God, and especially by those who have no idea of how to ascend from the letter to the spirit. Obviously, though, in the little book now before us, the word desire has been changed to the term love. In the passage where it says, I have adjured you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my kinsman, to tell him that I am wounded by love. Um, Song of Songs 5.8 Instead of the possible alternative, I have been struck by the dart of his desire. So, let us now, today, in the presence of God, let us pray to the Father in Jesus' name, in Jesus' blood and the Holy Spirit to instill in us this desire, this holy desire this love, this agape, this longing for the Lord. Father God, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' blood, we ask you to give us this longing, this love for you. Help us to desire you. Help us to fall in love with you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' blood, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And, and may God Almighty bless you and protect you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.